Oh, uh, good afternoon, morning, evening to everybody, and welcome to the continuation of the advances in INSAR sessions here at uh, Fringe 2021. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, we have uh, five papers scheduled with some time for questions afterwards. And I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, as we go, uh, to um, you can submit your questions through the Brella platform. And uh, if we have time at the end of, the uh, of each talk, we can take a question or two, but there will be a time set aside at the end for uh, all of the rest of the uh, rest of the questions. I'd like to first let me I will introduce myself. I'm Howard Sebker. The session is co-host co-chaired by uh, Eric Fielding, and we will be alternating with the introductions. So with all that said, let's go ahead and uh, begin the first paper. Um, it is entitled Tectonic Displacement Mapping from SAR Offset Time Series Noise Reduction and Uncertainty Quantification. Uh, the paper will be given by uh, Zhang Yunjun, and the other authors are Haresh Fatahi, Virginia Brancato, Paul Rosen, and Mark Simons. So, uh, Zhang, go ahead and it's all yours. Uh, Zhang, you are muted. Okay. Thank you. We know that SAR data can measure the relative distance change in the outside direction between the radar antenna and the ground surface using either the face information through interferometry or INSAR or using the offset information through pixel tracking of or pixel through spectral tracking or pixel tracking technique. For either of them or both of them, the component is the same. The range of observations, including these few components, uh, for both of them and for the motions of the Earth's surface specifically, it includes the deformation part from the tectonic or non-tectonic processes, which has a wide variety of, of scales from millimeter, centimeter scale to meter scale. It also includes the solid earth type, which can be uh, which can be 20 centimeters plus and minus. Compared with these two, the other components are relatively small. It includes the ocean tidal loading, the pole tides, the atmospheric and, hydro and, and hydrological loadings. SAR offset, also known as the spectral trapping or pixel trapping or SAR image cross correlations. Traditionally, it has been used to map or measure the fast deformation processes, such as the ice velocities of Antarctica or Greenland or the large cold seismic deformations on Earth's surface. However, with the availability of very long time series of SAR images from Sentinel 1 and the, and the ability of the GPU based SAR cross correlation technique, which has a significant speed up compared with the CPU based technique, we are wondering whether. Can we use SAR offset to measure the slow surface deformation, which is in the millimeter and the centimeter scale or not? So compared with SAR interferometry or in SAR, SAR offset has several advantages. First, it does not require face unwrapping, which is computationally expensive and error prone. Second, the SAR offset is a specially absolute measure, which means it does not require special reference point. This makes the stitching, this makes the mosaicing or stitching easy, and uh, and is also easier to scale to large area processes. And last, the workflow to derive SAR offset is easier than the workflow of INSAR. The, dis the disadvantage is that the SAR offset has usually relatively low precisions and low spatial resolutions. So here we choose the Southern California as a test site. And uh, we know that Southern California hosts, and here we ho here host the Southern San Andreas Fault and the San Francisco Fault. And from INSAR, there's already estimated slip rate of around 5.5 uh, centimeter per year in line of sight directions. And the questions here we're trying to answer is, can we use the SAR range offset measurement to, do, to, to measure this small displacement also? So theoretically, for a single pair of SAR offset, 
the achievable accuracy of cross correlation is a function of the number of samples n and the spatial coherence as plotted on the right, where the y axis on the left are the offset standard deviation in the unit of pixels, and the axis and the y axis on the right are in the, un are the standard deviation in the unit of centimeters for different range boundaries of SAR missions. And we can see that for modern SAR satellites, such as 1701, ALOS 2, or Cosmos SkyMet, given a spatial coherence of 0.4 and with a relatively large window size, we can already achieve a standard deviation of around two centimeters or less, which is well within the, which is well within the scale of a spatial of a radar wavelengths. And if we conduct a 10 series analysis, we can then propagate this uncertainty from the stack of the offset pairs to the 10 series and velocities as listed here, which is the same linear propagation as the inside place as the inside time series analysis. And through these equations, we can then plot the standard deviation of the, of the offset velocity as a function of time. Here, this plot is, is assuming a regular acquisition of every 12 days with a constant spatial coherence of 0.6. And in the case of 1701, which is already now over six years, and this will give us already a standard deviation of around half a millimeter per year. So, which means that the theoretical analysis seems promising. In practice, we use the cross correlation technique as a diagram shown here, where we choose a reference chip from the reference SLCs. We choose a larger secondary chip in the second SLCs. Then we conduct a normalized cross correlation between these two chips in both, two, in both range and atmos directions to derive a correlation surface. Then we zoom in to find a small windows and uh, to find a small windows around the correlation maximum and apply a, an oversampling to get an oversampled cross correlation surface. This, this, this surface is used to derive the subpixel level of offset in both range and atmos directions. And here there are two key parameters. One is the chip size the other is the is the other is the correlation surface of the sampling factors. These two controls the accuracy in practice, and the uncertainty of the estimation can be estimated from the curvature of the correlation surface, which can be saved as covariance matrix. Here we use the GPU-based amplitude cross correlation or PiQM core from IS2 software in a local station with eight GPUs. And after the cross correlation, we mask the offset with the standard deviation within a threshold and apply a median filter with a window size of around seven kilometers. Here is how the offset look, here is how the offset looks like only in the range direction here. On the left is the range offset field in the unit of pixels and on, and on the right are the standard deviation derived from the correlation surface. And here, the, here we choose a chip, a chip set of 64 side by 64 with an oversampling factor of 32, which is commonly used in the glaciology studies. And if we start to increase the chip size, we can see we're getting a smaller standard deviation and a, clear and, a more, and a cleaner range offset. And if we increase the oversampling further, we get a more nicely sampled offset field. And this is the configuration we use for the cross correlation. So we do the same thing for the whole track, where we choose a Sentinel-1 descending track in Southern California. It has over 170 acquisitions. These, these SOCs are co-registered using the pure geometry method. And we form a network of offset pairs with five nearest sequential connections, giving us over 800 pairs. And we conduct a, a classic small baseline time-series analysis method with the least square estimation, which is which is which is the same as INSAR. Here the link here, the network shown as here, where each dot represents a SAR image and each each line represents an offset pair. And the color of the line are the average range offset standard deviation for all pixels on left. And uh, this is how the range offset pan series looks like. Here this time series is referenced to this image marked by the star. And note that this range offset is a special absolute, which means it does not have special reference point. So this is different from the interface time series. 
And then we can conduct a noise reduction by correcting the phase contribute by correcting the offset contributions from various sources, just like in SAR. We correct the tropospheric delay using the ERA5 weather reanalysis data set, uh, conduct using Pi APS software. We correct the solid earth height using a Pi solid software, which is available online on GitHub. And this software implements the IERS 2003 conventions. And, no, and this is how the solid earth tide looks like. This is one component, the vertical component of a solid earth tide at Los Angeles, a mass spanning two masses. And if we conduct a power spectrum analysis, uh, these are the power spectrum looks like. And we can see that the dominant uh, component is the M2 type, which is, uh, which is a gravity pull from the moon to the Earth. And this type has a dominant around 12 hours period. And note that because of the because of Sentinel-1, for example, with a 12-day sampling, this will introduce a frequency aliasing. And this 12 hours period in INSA will appear as a 64 days period. We also, uh, uh, there's also impact from the ionosphere, and the ionosphere is significant for L band data and C band ascending data, but much less in the C band descending data. So it's not corrected here in this data set. And for more information, please check Kelly's Patathy's presentation on Tuesday morning. So here we correct the face from the offset, and this is the raw range offset. Look, this is the raw range offset where a map view, and on the right are the this of the displacement time series of these red triangles here. And we can see that after correcting for the solid earth side, it's getting cleaner. After correcting for troposphere, it's getting even more cleaner. And we can see that actually there is a systematic bias of around 10 centimeters between the Sentinel 1A and B sensors. So, <clears throat> so with this final displacement time series, we can just uh, apply a linear feeding to get the linear loss velocities. And we also excluded for this data set, ex excluded the acquisitions from Sentinel-1B2. And note that uh, here there's some spotty patterns with here on here uh, and here and here around San Diego. And these special patterns are, are short wavelengths and we believe they are artifacts. But there are some real signals. First real signal is clearly we see there is uh, if there's a displacement uh, gradients across the south across the San Andreas fault here and across the San Francisco fault here. There is a southern sea, and we can also see there's a strong, very large uh, displacement signal around here in the in the sand dune uh, in uh, in Agodon dunes in the uh, between the U.S. and Mexico borders. If we plot a profile across these two faults. And we can see that the velocity across these two port, it has a clear slip rate of around 1.5 centimeter per year, uh, consistent with the inside measurement. The other signal, this is the this is the signal from the sand dune movement on the on the uh, on the Agondon dunes. So the one one that, minute thing. Oh, thank you. Uh, so the signal is really large. Uh, we compare we can compare the SAR offset with GNSS, and here both the GNSS and offset are referenced to the same state here. We can see they overall are very consistent with each other, except a few outliers here, here, and here. And we can see a cross correlation. We can see that the R square is around 67% with an R massy of 6 millimeter per year. And with this, we can then conduct the uncertainty. One uncertainty is the uncertainty of the linear feeding from the time series, as shown here. These uncertainty are actually conducting the component from the atmospheric delays and the nonlinear deformations and the biases between the subswaths of Sentinel-1A here only. And also, we can through the linear propagation to propagate the standard deviation from the stack of offset to the velocity field, and when as shown here. And these are the uncertainty due to the offset estimation. You can see that this offset is much smaller than this one. And in the future work, we should be done more on the masking and filtering of offset and the more careful handling of time series analysis for partially coherent pixels. So in conclusion, yes, we can use SAR offset to measure the slow tectonic deformation because of the ability of very long time series and the noise reduction from solid earth side and atmosphere. And it seems like with GPU-based star cross correlation, scaling the algorithm is feasible and promising. 
and the source of the sun or and the source of uncertainty includes the offset estimation, which is not a dominant ones, and the atmosphere delay and other tidal effects such as ocean tidal loading. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Zhang. That was uh, really interesting. I have some questions, but I'll put them off till the end of the uh, session, if that's okay with you, because we need to move along. So, um, Eric, uh, over to you. All right. My, uh, yes, our next speaker is uh, Ji Hong Liu uh, from Central South University. And he's going to be talking about a method for estimating three dimensional surface displacements from heterogeneous INSAR measurements based on strain model and variance component estimation. Okay, okay, thanks. <clears throat> Hmm. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Ji Hong. Uh, comes from Central South University, Changsha, China. Uh, today my presentation is about a method for estimating three-dimensional surface displacement with insert based on stream model and variance component estimation. In, sorry. In the following, the this aspects will be introduced. As shown here, uh, quite different uh, uh, ground surface deformations may result in the possible similar INSA observations. Uh, this is because uh, the INSA mirrors the loss projection of real three-dimensional deformations. Uh, that is, uh, we count absent the three unknowns from one, one equation. Uh, this is uh, one of the INSA limitations. Uh, directly, we can, we can combine multi-direction uh, INSA measurements to, to get the three deformations. However, uh, this, this strategy is only, applic only applicable uh, with the left-looking mode SAR data or in the high-latitude regions. Also, with the aid of pixel offset tracking or MAI and the BOI method, we can uh, combine the complementary uh, electric displacement measurements to, uh, to monitor the larger magnitude uh, displacement, such as the earthquake or the volcano eruptions. Also, uh, by combining uh, also, we can also uh, uh, absent the three de deformations by combining INSA and GPS data uh, because they have the complementary uh, uh, advantages for uh, monitoring uh, the ground surface deformations. However, this method should uh, uh, with densely distributed GPS stations. In short, no no matter what kinds of in some measurements uh, we used uh, for uh, estimating the three de deformations, it is uh, required to establish the observation model. The, ob the observation model represents the relationship between the observations and the unknowns. Given the observation vector L and the observation model B, uh, we can get the estimation of the unknowns uh, the unknowns based on a weighted least square. Given, given a, a, for a target pixel, uh, for a target point, we have four inside observations. And uh, with the weighted least square method, we can get the three unknowns. And for, e and for each pixels, we repeat this process. We can uh, absent the final 3D deformations field. However, for the geophysical process, the, the deformations of adjacent points are correlated. Uh, that means the, the red and the green points deformations are correlated here. Uh, therefore, uh, this pixel by pixel uh, 
weighted least square method uh, may unreliable and unrealistic in some cases. And uh, uh, in, in 2011, uh, Gole Mina proposed a system method which uh, combines the uh, inside and the GPS uh, data to get the final 3D deformation deformations. Uh, in this method, uh, 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 the authors consider the string correlation of adjacent uh, GPS points and uh, uh, therefore don't require the interpolation of the GPS observations. And this uh, works uh, demonstrate uh, the superiority of the stream model in estimating the 3D deformations. Besides of the observation model, uh, the weighting matrix is also very important in the weighted least square method. Here, the stochastic model represents the weighting matrix D. And uh, at present, uh, several methods can be used to determine the weight matrix P, uh, such as uh, uh, equal weight uh, or using a moving window or using the far field observations to determine the weighting matrix. However, however this method is a little uh, empirical and we need a better way to determine the weighting matrix P. Uh, in this presentation, we propose a method for estimating 3D deformation, 3D displacement with INSA. And this method focuses on the uh, as, as establishment of the, observ the observation model B and the stochastic model P. And uh, for convenience, we uh, abbreviated uh, our method as uh, SMVCE here. And the first, uh, for the observation model, we established it uh, based on the stream model. Uh, based on the stream model, the, uh, uh, the 3D deformations uh, D0 and the DI of adjacent, uh, adjacent points can be established as here. And uh, we re rewrite this equation as here, and uh, uh, where the X, uh, the, the um, 3D deformation vector uh, of the central point uh, D0 is included in X. Then considering the inside imagined geo geometry, we can determine the uh, uh, inside observation Li and uh, the, uh, the relationship between the inside observation Li and the 3D deformations Di. And combining these two equations, we can get the relationship between Li and the 3D deformations D0 of the central point. Uh, also, there are plenty, there are a number of Li around the, uh, the, around the central point. Therefore, we can get uh, plenty of equations. Additionally, we can only equation, we can only establish one equation between the L, L0 and the uh, D0. Uh, and in this paper, we can uh, get uh, uh, plenty of observations between the uh, Li in a window and the uh, 3D deformations of the central point. And this cartoon gave, gave the basic uh, uh, idea of our proposed method. We can use uh, uh, these observations to get the central, the 3D deformations of the central point. Uh, and uh, based on the observation model uh, with uh, uh, many equations, we can use the variance component estimation algorithm to determine the weighting matrix that is uh, the stochastic model. And uh, we also uh, determine the standard deviations of each observation so that we can, uh, we can conduct the accuracy assignment. And uh, first, uh, we use uh, the simulated experiments to uh, validate our proposed method. Here are four, four simulated observations. 
And for comparison, we use the pixel by pixel weighted list of supreme measures as a benchmark. And uh, as, can, uh, as can be seen, the spatial pattern uh, between different methods are very similar. And uh, here gives some quantitative uh, evaluation of the uh, method. And uh, we can see our method can de determine uh, more accurate uh, 3D deformations as well as uh, more accurate uh, the weighting factors. And uh, then uh, we use our we use the proposed method to obtain the 3D deformations uh, associated with the 2016 Kakuro earthquake New Zealand. Here the loss uh, ascending descending uh, LF, LF2 and the Sentinel One star data. Inside MI pixel of setting of that tracking method are used uh, uh, to determine the uh, inside observations. Uh, also, there are plenty of GPS data which can be used for the error correction and the accuracy validation. Here are the the evident uh, uh, inside MVR or pixel of that of that tracking measurements. Uh, uh, there are twelve observations observations. And here is the 3D deformations we obtained. And comparing with the GPS data, uh, we find our method can achieve a higher accuracy. <coughs> and, uh, besides, uh, and also, uh, the employment of the variance component estimation algorithm, we can also uh, we can also obtain the standard deviation of each kind of observation. Here we can we can see the result is reasonable, and uh, the DNSAR measurements have the uh, have, have the have the most accurate uh, uh, accuracy, and uh, the pixel of size the accuracy of the pixel of of size tracking method is the lowest lowest uh, uh, accuracy. And uh, another case study is about uh, the. 2016 uh, Totori earthquake in Japan. This case study has two interesting points. Uh, uh, the first one is the, le the, the left looking uh, star data is uh, available in this uh, area. And, uh, but uh, the, coverage, the coverage of different star data is inconsistent. And uh, this, is, this will result in the possible uh, the possible error in the spinal 3D deformations. Here are the four DNSAR uh, uh, observations that is uh, ascending left, left, left looking mode, ascending right, right looking, uh, and the descending to, to observations. And uh, by, com by comparing with the uh, weighted list of primary measurements along two profiles, we can find that our method can achieve a higher uh, accuracy, especially in the boundary, uh, in the boundary, in the boundary area. And by comparing with the GPS data, we can find that the the three D deformation uh, deformations can reach the accuracy of uh, centimeter centimeters, uh, which which illuminate uh, that uh, the superiority of the DNSA observations combination for estimating 3D deformations. And finally comes the conclusions. And in this presentation, we propose uh, uh, an SMVC method which can improve the accuracy of 3D deformations. And also the accuracy assignments of INSA observations can be achieved. Uh, also, the demo code of this method is av uh, available for me. And uh, uh, final de further details of this method can be found in our published paper. And uh, thanks for your attention. Well, thank you. That's a very interesting uh, uh, subject.
Uh, Howard, do you want to introduce the next person? Sure. <clears throat> Our next paper is entitled Machine Learning for Unsupervised Automatic Detection of Transient Phenomena in INSAR Time Series. The paper is by Anza Shaquille, Richard Walters, Nora Al-Mubayed, and Mark Allen, and Anza will be presenting the paper. Anza, we Hi. see your... Ah, there you go. Yeah. Hi, I'm Anza from Durham, and I'm going to talk about machine learning for unsupervised automatic detection of transient phenomena in INSAR time series. Uh, so INSAR is a valuable tool for detecting and measuring all sorts of deformation on a global scale caused by earthquakes, volcanoes, and landslides. Uh, this uh, this data has large volumes and low signal to noise ratio. This makes this task difficult and manual analysis is not feasible. So the demand for an automatic system is very high. Machine learning, on the other hand, is capable of uh, capable to learn from these complex data structures, and it has been used in the past for classification and localization purposes using uh, already trained uh, off-the-shelf uh, deep learning models. Uh, which are uh, less flexible and require uh, already recognized specific events. We take a completely different approach of unsupervised anomaly detection, where background noise is characterized as normal and rare events are flagged as anomalies. The benefit of this approach is that we make no assumption on the time, location, and spatial temporal pattern uh, of the deformation, all of which may be unknown. Uh, the idea is to make the most of the unique three-dimensional uh, data set. Here, for example, the six interferogram shown in these black lines uh, captured the displacement covered by the four epochs, which are the single SAR acquisition shown in the circles. Uh, so they capture the displacement corresponding uh, the these four epochs. Each interferogram uh, each interferogram uh, interprets background noise relative to its epoch. For example, here, the right-hand side, the red one, is negative, uh, uh, is positively correlated to the uh, uh, to the blue one, which is uh, negatively, which has a negative contribution. So, in in here, we can see that the red line, which uh, which represents an anomaly between epoch two and three. So the four interferogram that captures the anomaly uh, is shown here. So deep learning can harness this fundamental difference to separate out noise from deformation, create a method that uh, that takes the stack of interferogram lines and estimates a self-consistent set of unknown noise fields for each epoch, which are the circles. And the deformation that is anomalous, uh, shown the, uh, as a dashed line, uh, as a dashed red line, will not be able to match by this rigid structure, and we can detect that by a poor misfit. Uh, in practice, we organize our data uh, that in every training iteration, we pass a set of 26 interferograms that is made up of from nine uh, epochs shown here. The temporal sliding window is of size nine uh, that runs within the epochs covered by a, uh, covered in a frame. The window moves forwards uh, in the time series, ensuring an overlap of five epochs and its corresponding interferograms in every next uh, input sequence. Each epoch goes four times ahead and uh, in the training frame, and this is how it is automatically designed by Comet and represents trade-off redundancy with uh, versus the computing cost. Uh, here I'll discuss the methodology. So the training frame used uh, in the experiment is from Turkey. Uh, the frame from the northern coast of Turkey is divided into patches of size 256 cross 256 with a 50% overlap. We design a model that takes and learns from a set of interferograms to generate the corresponding op uh, epochs. Our method is unsupervised and as no prior knowledge of epoch is used while training. So in this case, uh, our input is of 
26 interferogram and the output we get is of nine epochs. Uh, deeply talking about the network architecture, it is basically an autoencoder that consists of convolutions and LSTMs. We call this model Aladdin, an autoencoder LSTM based anomaly detector or detector of deformation in INSAR, which is about to be submitted in a day uh, in ACM 6 spatial 2021. Uh, so the model performs really well, but there's still room for, for improvement. And due to the overlap of the five epochs that we've seen in the previous slide between two consecutive sequence, so the model output should be similar, but uh, uh, but it is inconsistent. So uh, with this issue, the other thing that we have to consider is the size of deep learning model that is fixed, and we cannot pass the whole time series altogether because it is computationally expensive, and uh, the total number of the programs in every frame uh, uh, varies. So, uh, so to learn the flow of the complete set, we exploit the overlap of five epochs and introduce temporal dependency while training the, the already trained uh, model shown at the previous slide. And by passing the uh, predicted five epochs of previous sequence for every current sequence that is uh, going into the model. This method is unique because it evolves with previously learned epochs while training. Uh, on this slide, we show the results. Uh, so uh, the, sequence to, uh, the sequence four, five, and six shown here are passed through the model. And you can see that between the overlapping uh, epochs that are in the red box, uh, they are not consistent. And it is more clearer, clearer when we subtract them and the differences show, shows the inconsistency. On the other hand, when we pass the same sequences through our new uh, architecture, we see that uh, it is temporally dependent between the uh, overlapping uh, epochs. And uh, when we look at the differences, they are almost near to zero in comparison uh, with the results from the previous model. Uh, on this slide, uh, we show the, the output of a model. So basically, uh, GT here represents ground truth, which is uh, the raw interferograms. And the reconstructed ones uh, here are the ones uh, made from the estimated epochs by the model shown here. And residual is basically what is left behind and what, we could, what the model couldn't reconstruct. And uh, uh, we can see that the accuracy of epoch, uh, as we have no ground truth for the epochs, so the accuracy of the epochs can be judged by how well the interferograms are reconstructed and matches with the ground truth. So for, for flagging and the testing procedure, we pass the data through the model and the uh, and the residual based epoch intervals are computed using an s pass uh, like inversion and then these are passed for a semi variogram and clustering analysis both then combined the anomalous deformation events are then flagged and the and the spatial structure of them is computed and subtracted and reprocessed through the model to ensure that uh, uh, that we have detected anomalies with an improved accuracy uh, uh, a synthetic 2D Gaussian uh, deformation of magnitude uh, uh, 11 centimeters and wavelength 1.5 kilometer is added at eight different intervals uh, in the time series. Uh, the semi variogram shown here clearly separates uh, the red anomalies from the blue normal ones, and so does the clustering. But uh, the clustering still has some false positives, but when they both combined using an and, and operation, it is filtered. And we can see that the predicted spatial structure of those eight flagged anomalies matches with the, uh, with the, with the synthetic deformation that was originally added. Uh, we also test a real earthquake test case of magnitude 5.7. Uh, it is tested through the model and the model successfully flags the earthquake anomaly. The temporal accuracy can be seen here. 
uh, where the input into fairgrounds are incoherent, but still the output responses in the, the uh, but still the output responses are temporally meaningful uh, in comparison with the rest of the uh, spatial structure of the earthquake anomaly. Uh, another point to be noted is that the model is very well generalized because this test case is in the southern part of the Turkey and has never been seen by the model before while training. Uh, the residuals of the normal interval is shown here for a comparison, which is almost zero as compared to the case where an earthquake occurred. Uh, the before and after uh, images of the predicted responses are shown here uh, the first row shows the the first row shows the predictions when uh, uh, before removing the anomaly and the bottom row shows after removing it and uh, the new predictions which are these are much more cleaner as compared to before and they when subtracted with the ground truth gives us more improved and clean residuals that are used to improve the predicted uh, spatial structure of the anom anomaly. And here we can see that the structure is well constrained as compared to the previous, uh, previously had biased uh, spatial structure that was predicted. And this when uh, completely removed, we have a residual shown in the black box that is free from the earthquake anomaly. So we, we have developed a synthetic test data because we have no ground run, we need to compute the accuracy and the capacity of the model. So we design a synthetic test data by adding 2D Gaussians of varying magnitudes and wavelengths. And then this test data is tested through the model to see the, uh, to see the range of, of its detection. The y-axis uh, on the plot shows the different magnitudes and x axis shows its uh, relative wavelengths. And overall accuracy for each of these test cases is plotted. What we can see is that for signals with peak line of sight of displacement of few centimeters or more, that is one to two fringes, and of length scale greater than a few hundred meters, it displays an overall accuracy of 80 to 90%, which is shown here in the pink polygon. Uh, so in summary, we have established a normal uh, machine learning framework to estimate epoch time series, which is a single dates are acquisition from a stack of interferograms, the difference images, exploiting the unique 3D structure of the data and learning the spatial and temporal patterns. Our model is unsupervised, that is, we need no prior knowledge for training or for testing and is even diagnostic anomaly detection that it can detect deformation, uh, that it can detect anomalous deformation of all sorts. Our method can now automatically flag intervals containing deformation and separate the deformation from the normal background time series of noise. And it can successfully identify synthetic deformation signals with the peak line of sight displacement of 4 to 11 centimeters and of length scale 300 meter to 12 kilometers with a high accuracy of 86% and an 83% true positive rate. And it has been used to detect a real uh, magnitude 5.7 earthquake and unwrapping errors within the Southwest uh, test case of Turkey. Yeah. Thank you and yeah, open for any questions. Well, thank you, Ansa. That was um, a creative way to apply machine learning. I enjoyed that. Uh, I think we are close enough to the schedule that I would still like to defer the questions until the question period at the end, if we could. And um, Eric, uh, back to you. Yes, and our uh, next speaker is uh, Vitske. Brower uh, with uh, working with Ramon Hansen at uh, TU Delft. And the title is An Analysis of INSAR Vector Displacement, uh, Displacement Vector Dis Decomposition Fallacies, Facts, Fictions, and the Strap Down Solution. And I, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Vitska, and uh, this talk is about the way that we, or the INSAR community, 
uh, reports and communicates our results to others. So uh, both in papers, on maps, graphs, and figures. So uh, the reason behind this study is that we were uncomfortable with the way that uh, inter results are reported, and especially concerning uh, claims for the decomposition of the line of sight factor. So uh, we did a literature study covering about 50 papers, uh, all reporting on the INSAR uh, results. And we found many statements that um, were either incorrect or uh, misleading or um, misinterpreted. So uh, for example, um, we think that claims uh, to decompose the line of sight factor into an east-west and a vertical component from uh, only one ascending and one descending orbit is actually wrong. Um, so now in this talk, uh, I don't want to suggest that the uh, authors do not understand the problems related to the uh, inside displacement estimation, but at least we concluded that um, there's a clear need to improve our jargon on this. So um, let me talk you through a couple of examples. So in this slide, you see a cutout of papers where we underlined uh, some of the statements that are either wrong uh, misleading or misinterpretable, and uh, please do not read all those statements. In the next part of the presentation, I will talk you uh, through through the details of this. Um, and I also just want to stress that the aim of this presentation is not to blame uh, all the authors that they did something wrong, because in fact, we in our own papers also had some flaws and loose uh, formulations. But I think uh, I want to have a critical look at what we as the INSAR community uh, yeah, do wrong here. So uh, the question now is, what, uh, why are those statements that you see here, why are they incorrect? So, um, and in fact, I would like to yeah, categorize the fallacies that we found in our literature study um, and yeah, show that to you. But first, uh, let's quickly review the mathematical background of the problem, even though this it is obvious to most uh, of you, but just to be complete. So um, at the right-hand side of this equation, you see the, uh, the unknown real-world displacement parameters, the DE, the DN, and the DU. Um, and at the left-hand side of this equation, you see the, uh, the line of sight observation. So that is what is measured by the satellite. And um, in the matrix in between, that uh, the theta and the alpha, that's um, reflects the, the geometry of the orbits and also the viewing geometry of the satellite. So uh, it's clear that we have an underdetermined problem if we have one observation only, since we have three unknown displacement uh, components. So that means that the solution space of this problem is a plane, and that's what we, what we show here in the graph. So the blue plane, that is the solution space when we have only one line of sight observation available. So the red arrow uh, represents the line of sight observations, and um, that means that uh, all orange arrows from the scatterer to a location somewhere on that plane satisfy the set of equations that is uh, on top of this slide. So from one, one line of sight observation only, uh, there's an infinite amount of arrows that ends up in the same observation. So we don't know what the true uh, direction, the true deformation factor is. So what, we can, what can we do about this? We can add uh, more observations from uh, both ascending and descending orbits and sometimes left and right looking satellites. And um, if we then have enough observations, we can solve for the unknown displacement components. However, in most cases, there are at most two line of sight observations available, one ascending and one descending observation. And that's what we see um, in the formula at the left hand side. So, um, that results in that we still have a solution of space, which is in this case a line. And all points on that line are a possible solution to this problem. So um, we cannot unambiguously solve for the unknown displacement parameters since we have an infinite amount of solutions. So um, yeah, this problem is well known within the INSAR community and uh, we all have to deal with this. But what do people do in general? And uh, that is what we try to do in this presentation. We, we try to categorize the, yeah, the different types of fallacies that we encountered in the papers that we reviewed. So um, this categories of fallacies that may help to talk about problems. So um, we found uh, that there was attribution error, projection error, decomposition fallacy, and uh, there was, were also fallacies related to the assumptions that were made. And uh, 
I will now um, yeah, talk you through the, the four types of errors. So the first one is the uh, attribution error. And uh, within this category, um, the line of sight observations are directly interpreted as the vertical displacements. So again, um, please don't, do not read all those statements here. It is just to, to stress that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that we see these uh, types of errors sometimes, or a lot actually. So um, basically what we see here, if we take, uh, for example, the lower box, we see that the line of sight deformation uh, is obtained from one view in geometry only, and that the maximum subsidence rate is estimated, what's called, and that um, assumes that there are only vertical displacements. However, we don't know that because, yeah, that is a known component. So let's have a look at another example. So here we see, we see a graph and the authors are presenting the vertical um, displacements in this, uh, in this map. However, when we then read the text, we, we see that the vertical displacements are computed using the available data. And the data that was available was only one viewing geometry and um, yeah, it was the line of sight data. So from this statement, it, it remains unclear what, uh, what the authors did. So maybe they projected the, the line of sight into the vertical, but yeah, we don't know that. So here's another statement where uh, the authors write that there are 15 SME images that are used to estimate again the vertical surface subsidence. So um, again, it remains unclear what happened here, and the paper does not say whether this data is projected yes or not. And if the data is not projected and if the line of sight data is directly used to estimate the vertical displacements, this uh, will lead to a severe underestimation of the displacements, and we really have an error. So um, this is what we call an attribution error. And then we have the second type, which is the projection error. And um, this projection error, um, we see that again, when there are only observations available from one viewing geometry. And in this case, the line of sight displacements are um, projected onto the vertical to uh, estimate the vertical displacements. And um, we have, to need to look at the verbs that I used here. So we see converted and transformed. So for example, we see that the line of sight observations are converted to vertical displacements. And this, those verbs, they, um, yeah, it seems that there is one-to-one -one relation. So if you have the line of sight observations, you can directly estimate the vertical displacements, which is not the case because you only have observations from one view in the geometry. What the authors can do here is that they, they can project the line of sight onto the vertical. But that is something different than the vertical displacements. So uh, let's have a look uh, at one example in more detail. So here we see we see a map, and they, uh, the authors they write about on vertical displacements. And if we then have a look at the text, we see that they write that the line of sight observations are converted to the vertical displacements. And uh, yeah, when they, but they only have one uh, view in geometry available. So um, the vertical displacement is something else than the projection onto the vertical, since not only uh, vertical displacements are mapped to the line of sight, but also horizontal displacements. So um, well, when you try to estimate the vertical displacements with projection, um, you can make a bias on the vertical displacements. So uh, what would be a solution to this problem is to um, remove the word converted here and, and, write, and write on the line of sight displacements are projected onto the vertical. And also in the, in the, in the graph on the map, the others can write inside displacement projection onto the vertical. So it is a little bit of a longer sentence, but the advantage is here that it's clear about what, what we see. And it is not an, an ambiguous uh, report. So uh, the third type of uh, fallacy that we see was the decomposition error. And this is an error that um, occurs when there are two observations available, and uh, mostly from an ascending and a descending orbit. And here the authors they, uh, state that they can estimate the vertical and east-west components, or they can reconstruct the vertical and east-west components, or they disentangle them from two observations. But remember where we start with that um, our insert problem, there are three unknowns and we need three observations. So um, you cannot estimate the vertical and east-west components from true observations. What you can do is um, let you define 
a plane, you can define any plane. So for example, the vertical east-west plane or the vertical north-south plane, and you can project your two observations onto this plane and then uh, estimate the components corresponding to those projections. So uh, again, here's an example. So we see indeed that horizontal and vertical products can uh, be estimated from one SN and one DSN data set. So we see the vertical velocities and the east-west velocities, but there are only two observations. So just to wrap up, uh, what, what have we seen so far? So first of all, we saw the attribution error and, uh, where, and we state that the line of sight estimates cannot or should not directly interpret as vertical displacements. Then we have the projection error where um, the line of sight displacements projected onto the vertical is really something else than the vertical displacements. And within the decomposition error, we saw that it is not possible to estimate the 3D displacement factor for two, from two or less line of sight observations. And also, it is not possible to estimate the vertical and east-west components from two line of sight observations. So, um, estimating the 3D displacement factor observed by only one or two viewing geometries is a what we call not possible unless case. So, it is possible when we add additional information, and we can do that in the form of assumptions or extra conditions. And sometimes the assumptions are maybe there, but we found uh, many cases where they were lacking, and sometimes they were uh, mentioned, and then sometimes they were misstated or incorrect or implausible. So here uh, you see three examples of the plot assumptions fallacy, and what they all have in common here is that the authors write on that your component is insensitive, and they therefore state that they assume that the north component is zero, but that is a bit strange assumption since the dn or the north component is an unknown and it is strange to say that you're insensitive for it and that you therefore assume that it's zero so that's what we also see here where uh, the authors write that they're insensitive and they assume that the dn which is the unknown parameter you don't know that because you want to estimate that parameter is zero and then here the authors they estimated the east-west velocities in the vertical uh, velocity. So another type of uh, flawed assumption is the case where we uh, then read that the author writes, okay, we are insensitive for the north-south component, and that they therefore uh, leave it out of the equation. However, this is a signal-to-noise um, problem, so to say, because as long as the signal is large enough, so as long as you have the large north-south displacement, then it would still be observed by your satellites. So um, you should say something about this signal-to-noise story when you, when you follow this uh, approach. So that brings me to the solutions uh, of the underdetermined problem. So if you try to, uh, to estimate or to say something about the displacements, and there is only one line of sight observation available, what the authors can do is they can present the line of sight observations in elder as the final product, but then it should be stated it's very clear that uh, in the papers or in the text or in the figures that uh, every displacement or velocity is in the line of sight direction and it should be, not be mixed up with the vertical direction. You can also deliver projection onto products. Um, so you can yet say we projected the line of sight onto the vertical. And here in this map, we see the projection. Um, for cases where there are two lines of observations available, so an S and an S and orbit, we can again deliver the projection on two products. So you can project your uh, observations onto the plane, and then it will decompose the estimates. And another case uh, is you can do a 2D decomposition with valid, plausible, and explicit assumptions. And uh, for this, we also develop a struck down approach, but uh, due to the time restrictions, I will not uh, go into that. So uh, that brings me to the conclusion. So um, the way that INSAR results are communicated is to lose and uh, often wrong. And this can lead to misleading results. So uh, we think that, that we need to streamline on how we communicate the results. And uh, therefore, we develop a taxonomy to label the different approaches and that, uh, that, yeah, that will help to streamline on this communication. So um, 
two ends. I, uh, yeah, we are currently working on a document on how we should streamline these communications. And um, yeah, we are, I'm not presenting it now, but we are working on it. And um, yeah, the aim of this presentation was also not to mark everything that went wrong, but it's also to open the discussion on this problem. So therefore, yeah, we're also interested in your input in this. So thank you. Thank you, Vitsa, Vitska. A very interesting talk about how to uh, better communicate the INSAR results. Uh, Howard, I guess you're going to introduce the next uh, speaker. Okay, um, this is the uh, final paper of this session, um, although I encourage everybody to stick around after this paper for the short discussion time that we will have. But uh, our fifth paper is entitled Data-Driven Stochastic Model for INSAR Time Series and Their Corresponding Reduced Data Sets. Uh, the authors are Sami Esfahani, Freak von Legen, and Ramon Hansen. And uh, Sami will be giving the talk. And you are you are muted, Sami. We see you. Okay, this is okay now. Uh, we see, uh, yeah, it's a little small, but that's okay. Why don't we go ahead? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, there we go. Full size. Okay. Good time, everyone all over the world. Uh, I think this is the last presentation of the day after a couple of hours, technical discussions. Uh, I hope it's still you have uh, time for uh, the last one. Uh, so the presentation is about uh, our study on the stochastic model for INSAR time series, uh, actually the precision of INSAR results, and also the precision of the results that usually we communicate to the users. That is, we reduce the amount of the data with some special temporal uh, data reduction. Why we need a stochastic model? It is clear we need quality description of the, for the INSAR products, like the formation rate or time series. And also, when we use INSAR data for geomodeling, or when we want to integrate this data with other kind of data, we need to know what is the uncertainty in the data and what is the stochastic model. There are challenges. Uh, we have large spatial temporal data sets, usually even today with Sentinel or TrustRx, 200 epochs with millions of pixels sometimes. So we're having a little trouble with your audio. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if it's a connection <laughs> thing, I don't know exactly what we can do. But uh, we have complicated yeah. linear processing algorithm. So it is difficult to use proper, easy error propagation rule for the final users. And also the algorithms, uh, we have algorithms with different assumptions. Well, would stopping the video help, Sami? Because so, so your shall sound we is continue breaking or, uh, Maybe if you close your video connection, so if it's your bandwidth, then... Is it, do you hear me now? We we hear you now, um, but you uh, come in and out. So maybe you could uh, turn your camera off and let's try to go through. Maybe that will make the audio and then you can turn it back on at the end. Okay, yes. I can uh, uh, oh, how, how, how 
off the camera now and how, how is it now? Please let me know if I should continue or... Uh, yeah, go ahead. We, we, uh, we, yes, we hear you now and we see your slides, so please try to go ahead like this. I I have no audio. Yeah, there is no audio. Um Sami, can you hear us? Um can you hear me? If so, um move a slide forward and backward and see if we see that. So I am not sure where we are. <laughs> Andre, would you have any suggestions? Oh, why don't yeah. we why don't we have some discussion about the papers that we have seen and if he's able to come in um then there are a few minutes left for him to go through his slides would would that be okay i think that's the Sounds best good to me yeah so um i don't have the uh i don't have access to the um questions that may have been submitted through brella does somebody have those Yes, they've been copied to the they've chat. They've been putting them into the chat here. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you see the chat window? I do see the yeah. chat window now. Um, and so it's a, all right, starting at questions. Uh, well, I'll just start reading some of these. And if somebody would like to uh, interrupt and ask a different question um, at some point, please feel free to do so. Uh, the first uh, question I have here uh, is for Zhang, and it is, what is the main advance of the method you presented compared to, and there's a paper by Kasu et al. I do not know what that, I don't recognize the reference immediately, but perhaps you know that. Yes, I know that paper. Uh, so both our work and the Kasu et al. 2011, are both using the SPAS algorithm for the inversion of the SAR offset 10 series. The difference is that CASU is using that, it's using the offset 10 series for large displacement and in a scale of around tens of centimeters to tens of centimeters to meters. Well, we're pushing that to estimate the millimeter scale of displacement. And this is achieved, uh, so, and this has, been, this has not been done before, and this is achieved through the very long time series, time series analysis the noise reduction, which we talked about the solid earth tight and the sphere, and the very and the relatively large scale, large chip size of the amplitude cross correlation. Okay, what I'm gonna do is cycle through the various papers because I've got about eight questions for Zhang and if we do all of them, no one else will get one. <laughs> so the next question is for Ji Hong. And it is plane strain conditions imply continuity between cells. How does your method deal with local discontinuities, uh, complex faulting scenarios? Which set? Okay, I, I will share. Can, can I share my screen? Can I share my screen? No, I have two page of PowerPoint to, to back. Better explain this question. Uh, give it, go ahead and give it a try. <laughs> I won't guarantee anything at this point. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I I I can I can share now. Wait, wait, wait a sec. Oh, wait a second. Sorry. Well, we oh, there we go. Okay. No. Uh, they, uh, this is a quite good question. Uh, yes, it is very common to for the earthquake that there are uh, some deformation uh, jump in the fault area. Uh, in, uh, in this situation, we propose a method uh, to deal with this situation. For example, uh, the stream model, the original form is uh, uh, for the three-dimensional displacement. Like this, if we consider the geometry, the inside geometry, we can convert this three-dimensional displacement into the relationship of inside displacement. Like uh, the, uh, here, the LK and uh, L zero is the inside uh, measurements at uh, P zero and uh, PK. Uh, therefore, based on this equation. Uh, we can uh, we determine a workflow to determine this problem. For example, uh, if we in, in a window, uh, the, fault, the fault is uh, this line. Uh, if we determine uh, the central, uh, the 3D deformations of the central point, we first uh, uh, remove the, uh, a half of the observations. We use uh, uh, some direct direction templates to determine which direction we should to uh, determine this law. And then we calculate uh, the, the unknowns in the last page. And then we recalculate the observations based on this unknowns. Um, this is the recal recalculated observations, and this is uh, the original. And this uh, the difference of this uh, measurements we can get uh, this one, uh, we can find that uh, the the measurements in the other side of the fault is uh, very larger. The recentials is very larger, and uh, we use uh, the recentials and uh, and the variance variance is calculated in this process, and we can get uh, the ratio R. And uh, if we set uh, a threshold. Here we can see the the R in the same side of the fault. The R is very small, while in the other side the R is very large. If we set a threshold, we can deter. We can remove the the uh, we can remove the inhomogeneous points from the original uh, window. Uh, this is what we. Uh, propose to determine uh, this uh, problem. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, I would like to do one more question and then uh, we have a copy of Sami's slides that um, uh, hopefully uh, Johannes can uh, uh, present those. Oh, I guess Ryan is going to present them. But let me ask the one more question since it's been on here for a while. This is to Anza, and it's a two-part question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Does your time series include atmospheric delays, and do you account for the temporal gaps in the time series for your LSTM models? Uh, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so how the data structure is designed, a design is that Comet offers that for each epoch, it goes four times ahead in time uh, to create the interferograms. But uh, there are some uh, some some epochs that goes either more than four or less than four times ahead. So, but due to uh, the deep learning models, that the the data needs to be fixed. So we just pick that it goes four times ahead. So anything that is beyond or less this. We exclude that so that we maintain uh, the structure all across uh, all across the data, starting from the first to the last time series. So yes, we miss some interferograms between them, 
but luckily the training frame that we've used to train the model was consistent and it was uh, we 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 had all all of the all of the data in it and yeah i hope i answered the question question well okay thank you and uh witske please don't take this as an affront but i would like to get a chance to have sammy slides shown so uh i if we don't if if there's time at the end we'll come back to you for the next question <laughs> And I don't mind staying a few minutes if other people don't at the end. So Ryan, are you going to try to present uh, Sammy's slides? Um, just for information, unfortunately, we don't have a backup. He never sent us the backup. Oh, I can see his back though. I can see him back. Because ah. I don't have a backup. Uh, I see. Slides uh, I thought that I got a message saying that they were perhaps there. Uh, okay. um, anyway, uh, Sammy, do you want to try one more time? We lost you with uh, the connection. Yes. Ryan says now that he has the slides. Yeah, there was a problem Good with job. connection and uh, okay, so let, yeah. let's let Ryan present and Sammy, you just try to talk to those. And um, if you drop out, he will start reading. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll uh, do our best. I, yeah, I hope it works. Uh, if you go one slide uh, back, uh, yeah, so next slide. Uh, so it is the importance of quality description. I think we know all, uh, we know all about it. Uh, we have large, large spatial temporal based data sets, thousands of points, millions of points, a lot of epochs, complicated and nonlinear algorithms, difficult for propagating the, er propagating the errors using the standard uh, routines and all, also we have different kind of algorithms so it is difficult to unify the stochastic modeling the approach so if we can go to next slide so we have we can have a look at a, a, a stochastic modeling from two perspectives one is uh, uh, uncertainty propagation to somehow have the initial noise structure for the raw SAR and INSAR data or get it from data and then propagate it through all the processing steps to the final INSAR time series. Uh, so there are challenges here. We don't have the initial structure always. And also this error propagation is too complex. Then another approach in the next slide is a data-driven approach that in a lot of software, a lot of papers, we see people, people already do that. So we somehow isolate noise components in a sing, signal-free area, somewhere that we don't expect the formation. And if we expect some small deformation, we somehow estimate and remove it, somehow isolate the noise. And then based on uh, statistic and show statistics, noise analysis somehow uh, estimate the noise structure. This is uh, the first motivation of this uh, a study in the next slide. So the first motivation is uh, we want to we want to do this data driven approach. We want to see if in the final results after filtering after uh, filtering atmosphere and everything is there any significant spatial temporal correlation in the noise components of insert time series and also what kind of covariance model or random function we can used to model to address this stochasticity. And then in the next slide, the second motivation is, okay, uh, we usually do not give the final insert time series to the users. We do data reduction. Uh, we average in time and space to reduce the amount of data. Then we should propagate the uncertainty to the final reduced data set. And if we want to do real error propagations, we should exploit large matrices. So here, the second motivation is to derive a simple analytical equation for the elements of the final covariance matrix of the reduced data sets. Next slide. This is the one, a study area on radar set two. Later in the same area, we, do, we have Sentinel-1 data. In this black box shows this uh, signal three area. In the next slide, I show why we use this uh, small 14 by 14 kilometer. Uh, so uh, based on the soil map, we know that we don't have that uh, uh, 
large uh, uh, peat soil here, so we don't that much, uh, we don't expect that much shallow uh, shallow the uh, shallow soil compaction. Uh, the PS results show we don't have uh, uh, large velocities here, and also we have absence of organic salts here. So we select this area as a signal three area, but still to remove all other remaining signal in the next slide, we remove. Uh, periodic signal and also one linear velocity to all the time series to isolating the noise. After isolating the noise, next slide, we have a spatiotemporal variogram on something that we think it is only noise. It's the only measurement noise. And then we see in the variogram, we see uh, the one axis in time, one axis is distance in kilometer. And in both space and time, we see correlated pattern in the variogram, the spatial variogram. So next slide, please. Uh, so we model this 3D variogram based on three different behavior. One nugget, that's just white noise, one uh, and two, one special and one temporally correlated noise. We try other different models, uh, models also, joint model, joint especially temporal model, and disjoint one, and this one gave the best results to us. Next slide, you see the fit that we get, gave uh, from from this model, the nugget uh, variance of white noise around eight millimeter square, and also the parameters of the spatial temporal signal, and you see the covariance, uh, you see the covariance, spatial temporal covariance function. Next slide, we see also uh, the fit to the spatial and temporal variograms. It's a very good fit we get for different temporal lags and, and uh, different spatial one in the next slide. So, yeah, this is just, we get to the good fit. It's slide 16, then later, we try the same thing on uh, Sentinel-1 data in the same area. This is the PSI velocity map. Next slide, slide 17, we see the model. Yeah, this is the radiogram. Still, we see the same pattern, temporally and especially correlated noise. And then we get this good fit with the, this joint model that I, I show you. So in the next slide, we can, yeah. So then this is the model. So we have now the covariance function. Next, next slide now, slide 20. Yeah, this is the, the model to get from uh, Sentinel-1. The numbers are very similar to the numbers that we get from radar set 2 Of course, a little bit different, but, uh, then now we can construct the full covariance matrix based on three different covariance matrix, noise or uh, nuggets, uh, temporally correlated components and especially correlated now component that you see now the covariance functions. But then the second problem come in, if we go to the next slide, that, uh, okay, now we want to propagate this to the full uh, covariance matrix of the reduced data set. So next slide. So in the reduction, now first let's look at the data reduction only in the space. So in, we, can, we can make a grid on the area and in each grid uh, we have some number of uh, persistent scatterers and the average, we, we do averaging. So they, most of the data reductions are based, mainly based on uh, data reduction based on averaging or weighted averaging, but here just we demonstrated for single averaging. So we have M number of points in each uh, averaging cell. We have the full covariance matrix of that derived from the previous slides. We do averaging and then we can prove this equation that I show you there that the variance of each cell can be also constructed based on the variance of the, uh, the, uh, the model. Uh, M number of the points and also the average covariances among the points between uh, in each cell, that is a S bar. So if we can go next slide, then I show more, uh, I give you more information on this model. So uh, the main component here, this is S bar. So this is the average of the, of the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix that we already have. And we can also make the, build the covariances between the final results of, between two different averaging cells. 
And that is also come from the average, in, average covariance between all the points among these two cells. So if we can to the next slide, then I, uh, we see the ingredients that we need. Ingredients that we need for the propagation of the data uh, to the variance covariance of the reduced data. We need the variance of the nugget effect. We need the number of persistent scatterers in each averaging cell. We need the average covariance among the points per cell. And we need the average cross covariances among the points for each pair of cells. And still, it's a lot. If you go to the next slide, still is a lot. Still, the computation of S bar and C bar in these equations are cumbersome when we have a large data set. So, we want to reduce it more. So, next slide. So, then without, can we, instead of averaging between covariance components, can we average among distances? and then put distance in the covariance function. So can we approximate the average covariances, C bar and S bar in the formula, as a function of the average distance among the points? If so, then the problem is easy. Then we should just store distances, and then we don't, and then later we can reconstruct the covariance matrix whenever we want. Uh, so if we go to next slide, the question is, can we do, use this approximation? For linear covariance function, it is dual. That's the proof you see. So I don't want to go to the details, but if the covariance function is linear, we can use such approximation. If the covariance is not linear, we have nonlinear, usually we have nonlinear covariance function, exponential, Gaussian, whatever covariance function, it works partly. It means it works only when the covariance function have a linear behavior. So it means for more or less small distances or average distances. If you go next slide, Then we try it. Then uh, we try it for, uh, for example, exponential uh, covariance model. And we see that if the grid cells, this is based on simulation, if the grid cells are smaller than uh, uh, double the range of the covariance function, then this approximation is valid. So in the next slide, we want to try it on real data and also on simulation based on the covariance functions that we we see in the first part of the slides. So based on the proposed approximation, we can construct the variances and covariances among different averaging cell based on these equations that I don't want to go to the equations. The, the more important is the ingredients that we need that we see in the next slide. So we need the covariance function, number of points in each averaging cell and distance between averaging cells. That's all ingredients that we need. If you only have data reduction averaging in a space, but we have a space and time. So if you go to next slide. So if you have a space and time, the equations are a little bit more complicated. All of them can be proved. And I hope in our paper, we have the proof of all of these equations, but we have six ingredients that we need. We need the coordinate of the center of the cells, averaging cells. We need the time of the center of the averaging intervals. We need the number of points in each cell. We need the number of epochs or SAR images in each averaging temporal interval. And then we need average, average distance among the points of each special cell and average time between the time epochs of the, each averaging time interval. So these, these elements, these ingredients, will can, can be simply computed and stored uh, uh, in parallel to the final data sets that we have. And then very easily based on the equations in this table, we can reconstruct the full variance covariance matrix of the final data. If we go to the next slide, So we have two different simulation uh, cell scenario. We have a big grid cells for averaging a small grid cells. 50 by 50 kilometer, five by five kilometer, 10 kilometer, one kilometer, a special grid period of three years, revisit time of 70 days and 11 days and six months of temporal. Every half a year, we have the averaging time. So the final time series have a six months interval. Uh, and then if you go next slide, we see the special and temporal grid that we use. I think one slide was, uh, but anyway, this is the 
This is the final variance covariance matrix of the data that we see for simulated scenario one and two. And we have a very good agreement between them. Even in the next slide, we see better the agreement between the diagonal elements of these two covariance matrices. One is based on approximation that we propose. One is based on full error propagation that takes a lot of time on our computer. The variances match very well in two simul simulation scenario. And also covariances. We can see covariances between cells in the next slide. Uh, Sami, we are at the uh, the end of our full period, yeah, I think so I'm if you also could perhaps, done. yeah, okay, I was going to say, if you could perhaps yeah. sum up, then so that I would think be great. <laughs> the next couple of slides, we can, you can go directly to conclusions, I think, if, yeah, this is re just one real data demonstration, the final covariance matrix, how it looks like. So you have a, if you go one slide back, just one second, uh, we see the final, the, 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 the matrix and the uh, below right is a full variance, it's a, a sparsity pattern of the covariance matrix. We have a lot of special and temporal correlation between final time series, even if we remove atmosphere because of all filtering the stuff that we do in time series. And neglecting this or ig uh, ignoring this, uh, this special temporal covariance in, in the data can overestimate or underestimate the final quality of the final data that we, uh, we provide. So next slide is just a summary of what I said so far. So if we get to the, this is a summary and conclusion, we propose this model. And I want to invite you to another paper on, uh, uh, on Thursday about integration of multi-sensor in-star ground uh, uh, motion data set with other geodetic observation that then we use this stochastic model there for for this data integration. That's my last slide. So thank you very much and sorry for all these interruptions. These are backup slides, so we don't need to show them. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry for the, uh, you know, the connection uh, problems, but actually this was pretty good compared to <laughs> some of the online conferences I've thank been you. on. Thanks for the support so and the backstage from ISA. So I want to, I do want to point out to everybody that uh, a number of the questions have been answered in Slido, so people can read them there, and I encourage you to do that. Also, um, you know, we all have uh, emails and other messaging apps, so we can uh, send questions to people um, uh, as well. But I would like to thank all of our speakers. I thought these were all really interesting papers. I wish we had time to ask more questions and go out in the hall and talk about them after the session, but that doesn't work this way. Um, thanks also to Eric for helping uh, to co-chair the session and especially to the staff who were able to put all of this together. So, um, with that, why don't we formally bring this to an end? And, uh, and we also have the uh, the summing up session uh, uh, tomorrow, right? The uh, I don't yeah, remember panel the time. discussion tomorrow at uh, um, at this time, I think. Okay. Yes, right. that's a very important part of the workshop. So um, I hope that you, uh, chairpersons, uh, prepare a little bit. We didn't ask for for a set of seed questions this time, but it's good that if you uh, put your thoughts together so that then the discussion tomorrow will be more structured. Okay, that, uh, that's good. So everybody, uh, please um, consider tuning into that as well. So with that, why don't we bring this session to a close and um, at that, uh, with that, uh, you know, we'll, See you online for the rest of the week, and hopefully after that. Thank yes, you. Yes, there's one. There's one more thing that I'd like to say. Like to I like to remind everybody that we have a large amount of e-posters, and we have an e-poster sessions uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, where it's possible to interact with the presenters. So I urge everybody to take a look. So uh, it's um. Magdalena showed in her presentation how you can how you can find um, the name and the number of the of the e-poster and then you can find it via the Braille interface. So uh, happy browsing and see you tomorrow. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>